Actually, the best way to find a job that's to sound crazy is don't be looking for one. Ah. That sounds nuts, but the truth is, is that when you're desperate, when you're needy, when you're out talking to people because I need a job, I need a job, people will run from you. The time someone start looking for their next job is when they get one. Oh, so I hope the employers are listening to that. <laughs> Today, what is the best way to find a job? Daryl Gurney, author of Headhunters Reveals, has all the answers for you. Pleasure to have you here today, Daryl. Good to be here, Greg. So why don't we just start right there at the top. What's the best way to find a job? Well, actually, the best way to find a job, this will sound crazy, is don't be looking for one. Ah, don't be looking for one, okay. Well, that sounds nuts, but the truth is, is that when you're desperate, when you're needy, mm. when you're out talking to people because I need a job, I need a job, people will run from you. So what I tell people is the best way to get a job is don't be looking for one. Be out talking to people, be out meeting people, but don't have it be about your need. But don't you? But then the problem is though, if you're working, that people get wrapped up in their jobs, or they tend to put it off because they don't need a job because they've got a job. Well, or yeah, the truth. Well, if somebody's working a job, there's a couple ways that are best to look for a job. Is first create research projects where you're out talking to people about things that you're really interested. In. See, a lot of times people want to make a career transition, maybe into a whole new field, and they don't figure that they can. But the truth is, is that if you're out meeting people and you become top of mind with people in the field, mm -hmm. then those people think about you when something comes up. Headhunters, of course, are another way right, that someone's right. working. You know, well, since you've job. written Headhunters and Revealed, indeed, right. um, on that subject, now often you think of headhunters, you think of, you know, Big time executives or CEOs or something. Uh, is that all the, you know, do you have to be a CEO to no, work with a headhunter? As or? A no, as a matter of fact, headhunters have been around for 60 years. Uh, they are part of every job seeker's toolkit, but they can help anybody from uh, even day laborers. So there's, you know, there's, there's actually agencies out there that handle day laborers really? all the way to the super executives. And so because, you, you know, here you see them on a street corner, the day laborers. Well, but, that's uh, true. That's true. Now, <laughs> they could go to the headhunter. And there's others who go to the agencies and they get booked that way. But so the whole spectrum, basically from employment agencies, temp agencies, all the way to the executive search firms, mm -hmm. you know. And so how do you find a headhunter or, or do they find you? What, what, what's the, how does that work? Well, there's two ways too, and that kind of depends on the level as well, is um, if you're uh, wanting to temp or if you're uh, probably like a uh, anywhere from a fifty to $75,000 type person, uh, very often you'll go to a recruiter. You'll seek out a recruiter to represent you uh -huh. to positions they'll hear about. Um, if you're a $250,000 executive, very often the the search firms that operate at that level, it's kind of like, don't call us, we'll call you. Mm -hmm. So they are specifically out looking for a particular type. Now, I'm not saying the people at the uh, at the more moderate uh, salary ranges wouldn't be sought out too, but definitely at the high levels, they kind of come after you. Well, and you also kind of talk about some of the politics or the dynamics of it, if you will, because you sort of say like, okay, so if they're coming to find you, but I mean, does that mean they have the upper hand? Or I mean, you know, what's the kind of the relationship like with a headhunter? Are you bowing down to the headhunter and kissing their feet, or what's, no. you know, or are they kiss, kissing your feet, or yeah. what? <laughs> well, it depends on the Just economy. The, kind of yeah. depends on the economy. Um, in really boom times, like at the in the late '90s, do you remember before the dot com bust? Mm. There were so many good, back in the day, the yeah, good old days. Yeah. <laughs> there were so many good jobs, but there weren't as many good people for them. Mm. So the the candidates, it was a candidate driven market, is what you could call it. They really kind of ruled the roost. So whether if they lost a job, they'd have 20 offers the next day. Mm. So at that time, the recruiters were kind of like, you know, trying to hold on to the good candidates, so were the employers. Whereas now, where the, it's, this is an employer-driven market, you have way more good people than you have jobs, the employers kind of call the shots. And so in this market, uh, a recruiter, if a recruiter calls you, you're thankful and you're mm. lucky. You know, lucky, right okay. Now. Yeah. So now how does it work? Can you take us through, um, let's say you are lucky or it's a better economy and you do get the call from the headhunter because sure. you're just so damn good. Yeah. Uh, what, what are they going to do for you or how does this work on a, how are they going to work with you? Well, what they're going to do is uh, a good headhunter is not going to just start pitching you a position right away. Now, the reason they called you is likely because either you did submit your resume at some point and you're in their database or maybe they found you online because you, most people who are passive job seekers won't have something online though because that, you know, can look bad for your current employer. But, but if they call you Saw up, your resume online today. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but if they do call you up, 
uh, they're likely going to be telling, asking who you know, mm. you know. And now, if you like what they're talking about, they're hoping that you will. If they've really done a little research on you mm. and they see that you might be good for it, if you like what they're talking about, you may show some interest. But at a minimum, you may know someone who would be good for it. Mm. And so, the best way to relate to a headhunter is that they are just a messenger of opportunity. Mm. The opportunity might be good for you, it might be good for someone else, but you want to have the relationships with the headhunters because at some point when you do need to kind of call in your chits, mm -hmm. if you've been helping them, then they're, you're going to be top of mind with them. They'll be more likely to do whatever they can to help you. Okay, and so don't wait to the last minute when, like you said, when you're desperate or right. or want to go tomorrow or yesterday, and you know. Yeah, a good a good uh, a good policy is to have a few good recruiters always with your information. I mean, mm -hmm. even the day, um, a good friend of mine, Richard Bowles, who wrote What Colors Your Parachute. Oh, mm -hmm, sure. Yeah, uh, he, he was told by his mentor uh, that uh, the bet the the time someone start looking for their next job is when they get one. Oh. So in other words, not like you're being I hope the employers are listening to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, not like you're being distracted and not doing your best, but the truth is, and we see that now with what's going on in the economy right now, hmm. you never know what's going to happen. You never know when the rug's going to be pulled. Right. So therefore, it's good to be a passive job seeker all the time. And so a good policy is have a few recruiters out there that are always kind of keeping their finger on the pulse of the market, knowing what's going on. So and the recruiters are comfortable with the fact that you may be working with several of them? Well, uh, they don't. Here, here's the you thing. don't tell them. Yeah, yeah, right, basically. <laughs> okay. But the point is, is that like in a in, in a boom economy, they're gonna the really good recruiters are gonna try to get you to operate exclusively with them because mm. they don't want to run the risk that they're gonna lose you to something else. But again, everybody's got to look out for their own best interests. It's not good to have a hundred recruiters with your information. That's not even good for you mm. because if a position opens up and the company gets a hundred resumes with your name on it, it makes you look like chopped liver. Mm. Plus, they're not even going to consider you because they'll get into a cat fight as to who they're going to have to pay. Submitted by someone. Yeah, but don't just have one either. Have have a few have recruiters, a few. trusted recruiters that you've worked with. Now, if they try to force you into an exclusive arrangement, though, you shouldn't it, sign it or whatever they're going to try to get you to. I can't give any silver bullet rules, you know, for everything. Um, obviously, it depends on your relationship with that recruiter. What are they actually going to do for you? How important is that relationship? Mm. Um, in some of the booming economies, Economies, you know, it it might be worthwhile, especially if you're looking passively, if you're not actually needing a job right now, you know. But if you need something more timely, you might want to keep yourself a little bit more spread or spread out. We'll be right back. And we are back with Daryl Gurney, author of Headhunters Revealed. So what you talk about getting in the database, um, how do you get your resume in the database for the headhunter? Well, uh, first step is find the recruiters that manage what you do, send your resume in a uh, uh, both an attached Word document and in a text document. Hmm. Okay, that was it. interesting. I hadn't heard that before. Send it both ways. Yeah, you want it in a text document because now recruiters run and most HR departments run their uh, systems based on keyword searchable databases. Mm. So what you want to do is you want to get in that database. You want to have a resume that's keyword searchable too. You want to have all the jargon and the phrases and the words that relate to your field. And what you do is you submit that to the recruiter. They're going to immediately be able to tell if they can help you or not, you know, based on your field. You said you would scan a resume, what, in like three to five seconds oh, yeah. or something? Oh, yeah. and, uh, a, re a recruiter will spend at the most five seconds to look at a resume to tell if you're somebody they might be able to help. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be able to look at your stability. They're going to look at the field that you're in. Have you looked solid? Do you look like one of the top 10 to 15 percent? Because that's really the, the level of people that the recruiters are looking for. And if they might be able to help you, then they'll want to be able to put you in their database. They won't necessarily call you right away because they don't have anything to tell you about. Well, and one reason when you say send it, you know, in the email and also as an attachment, people don't realize. I mean, it, it takes work to get it in the database, and the harder it is to get it in the right. database, you know, you're kind of lowering the barrier there, so that it's more likely to end.
end up in. Exactly. First, she said the worst thing is to, is to mail it, right? Right, right. Well, today, no one would mail a resume. If you mail a resume, it's just... <laughs> Throw it in the garbage. Right? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I was through the recruiting... I was uh, in the recruiting industry whenever the facts came in and then whenever uh, scannable uh, OCR database... You know, OCR means optical character recognition. And so a recruiter would take your mailed-in resume, put it on a screen, and get a picture of it, and then they'd fix it all. But no one's going to go to that trouble anymore. So you just want to have it in text form that they can pop in right away. And so even faxing it can be a problem? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Faxing, mailing, just... Okay, don't even yeah, it's not cool today. <laughs> now, when you mentioned the keywords, I wanted to kind of just elaborate on that because I think that people may not... Cause, I mean, you have the idea, okay, they type in the words, but, you know, it's a sort of like Google where people, you make a comparison where people just load the website, well, maybe adult sites with like a triple X or something, you know, right, or right. whatever the case may be, you know, presumably that's not on your resume. Right. Right. <laughs> Probably not the right strategy, you know. But um, on the recruiter you want to see. Yeah, <laughs> and the industry, you know. <laughs> but, uh, um, but so how do you load it with the keywords without, I mean, how do you do it effectively in the, in the right way instead right. of well, just... Well, what you want to do is, first off, know the words that are relevant to your field. Hmm. Uh, uh, you should already be aware of them, certain certifications, certain uh, systems that you work with, certain softwares. And you want to make sure that that is in, embedded in your resume in the context of the resume. See, in the old days, whenever keywords like mega, uh, mega tag, meta tags or whatever, oh, uh-huh. you know, on the web, people would just put a block of all of those words, right? So that just they would be seen. Slap them in Right. Oh. And so sometimes people would do that with resumes in the early days. But the thing is now is that the, these, these uh, keyword searchable databases are so smart that you just want to have the words in there and so that when somebody looks at it, they can see where you did that. Where did you utilize right. that skill? Where did you utilize that software? In fact, you gave the example that um, I think for Sony Pictures, you said, well, you can't assume the computer is going to know because the computer won't, that that's entertainment. Exactly. You have to use the word entertainment in the resume. Exactly. Yeah. You know. So. So go for specifics when you can and go for have broader terms. For example, one time uh, a, a major national uh, uh, insurance company contacted me. They wanted me to fill a few HR manager roles, and they were looking for people who had change management background. Oh. Now, this was in the mid-'90s, and that was a term that had just started to come around. Hmm. I didn't even know the term myself personally. I hadn't come across it. But I went to my database, and I... Uh, searched change management and a lot of really sharp HR professionals came up. They oh. had it in there and then I was able to call them, you know, for those positions. And what, what is change management? Does that mean more? Well, change management, this particular insurance company had gone through a major legal thing and mm. so they were changing the whole corporate culture. Oh. So it was like, we're going to do things Fired different the around the good guy, here. brought in a new guy. Right, right. right. <laughs> no more con thing. games and scams. <laughs> <laughs> That's why everything's so honest now. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and speaking of honesty, you say, though, that you should really have a good, open, honest relationship with the headhunter, too, right. as far as... Now, should you tell them, you know, like, look, I hate my boss, or I hate my job, or, you know, I just got to get out, or, I mean, you know, what? How, how honest is too honest, or... Well, yeah, you can tell the recruiter any of that. I mean, um, because their whole objective in their relationship with you is to place you if they can't. Okay. Now, if you're and, negative... And you're not going to think, okay, we can't... Well, if you're negative Nelly, you know, and you're just, you know, hate everything. Hate the job, hate the company, hate yeah. the weather, hate the people. Like hate you, the... You're not going to give a good vibe for their <laughs> office, right? So, but the point is you can be open with them. And uh, what, what there is to do is to find the recruiters that you trust too, because part of it is looking to see, you know, is this person uh, going to be looking out for my best interest? Now, the, the thing to know is they're paid by the company. Ah. So they're not paid by the can the, the job seeker. They're going to look for the best interests of the company, yet they want to have good relationships with candidates, too. I, so over my career, I've placed one person like five, six times, wow. and, and I didn't go pull him out of a place I had placed him, but if he came to me and he said, hey, I'm going to get out of here, somebody's going to place me, do you want to Why help? Yeah, yeah. So the point is, is, is it, it has to go both ways. Well, in a way, it's kind of nice that the company's paying instead of you, right, as the candidate. Well, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And at the same time, though, that's why I wrote the book, because over the years, people would call up and say, 
you don't call me, you don't talk to me. They thought I was supposed to be their career coach or their career counselor. Mm. And so the thing is, I wanted people to know from the perspective of a headhunter how they operate, what's important to them, so that candidates would know how to best work with them. They're not there to hold your hand necessarily. They will be, not, they're going to take care of you because they need you for their clients, but at the same time, the client's needs comes first. They're not going to be calling you when they're looking to fill a position if you're not right for it. We'll be right back with Gerald Gurney, author of Headhunters Reveal. And we are back with Daryl Gurney, author of Headhunters Revealed. Okay, well, you mentioned career counseling, that they're often not career counselors. Should you have a career counselor, or what is the difference? And Yeah, big, big difference, and I think everybody should have a coach. Uh, everybody performs best with a coach. Um, actually, in 2001, I decided I wanted to teach people how to fish rather than just give them a fish as a recruiter, mm -hmm. and so I began coaching. And um, the role of a coach is to teach someone really to be their own headhunter, wow. how to market themselves, because you you wouldn't believe, Greg, even VPs of sales, VPs of marketing, who are great at spinning a product, mm. spinning a service, when it comes to themselves, just completely stink. Mm. There's something about ingrained in our personalities, don't toot your own horn right, or right. beat your own drum. Yep. And so one of the biggest things to teach people is how do they actually isolate their greatest talents and skills, brand themselves, and then go out and market themselves as mm. effectively as they do something else. Well, and I also like the fact that you say that people, you know, I mean, I love the entrepreneurial spirit in starting your own business, but you also say people forget that you should think of yourself as your own, that you really are your own business or self-employed, even if you're working for a big company, because you're like your own individual little, you know, your customers and your clients or your boss, whatever, maybe your customer if you think of it that way. Yeah. But in a way, it, it does kind of put you in charge in a different sense of like you are running your own business. Yeah. When I lead workshops and I try to take people outside of the employee mentality and I tell them, guess what? You've always had your own business. Always had it. You've just leased out your employable assets. Mm -hmm. But every business person needs to know what's the return on investment. So what are what's the return you're getting on the where you're investing your assets? So I get people thinking more about the fact that their time, everything they're dedicating is an investment. So do I want to invest it here? Do I want to invest it here? A good business person always knows other options. That's why I tell people, do the best at your job, but always have a headhunter, always have a career coach, have people out there that are supporting you to keep your options open. Now, I know how the headhunter gets paid. How does the career coach get paid? Do they take a commission or is it a retainer or how does that? No, they actually get paid by the job seeker. Okay. So in other words, if you were uh, wanted psychological counseling, you are you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that was a big end. That was a big end. But it, but if you wanted that, you would go pay the, the the therapist yourself. So you're paying a career coach to work with you as a coach. Okay. You know, you hire just like a fitness coach. Well, I know one of your maybe this is comes up as a career counselor, but you are big on teaching people how to sneak in the back door. Yes, yeah. that one of your. So how do you sneak? In fact, you snuck in the back door. I think I did. Actually, when I came out here, I moved out here at age 24. I didn't know a soul. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get into the entertainment industry. Um, I figured everybody wants to be in the entertainment industry. Right. So I actually went to a career coaching firm down in Irvine at the time, and I learned what I now call the backdoor method. Mm. And what I did by using that method, I met with the chief financial officers of the top seven entertainment studios wow. in their offices wow. within two months. I got hired by MGM, mm. and I never even went through HR. Wow. So the thing is, is that by creating relationships, I said it earlier in the uh, show, by creating research projects, like why would you want to go meet with somebody? What, what are you passionate about? What are they involved in that you'd like to know more about? Just getting on their radar, getting in front of those people. People will give you five minutes if you're really passionate about something. Hmm. And those five minutes you can build and leverage to be a relationship. And if you can be top of mind with people, when things do come up that would be of interest to you, if you're top of mind, you'll hear about those things. That's how well, can you give an example? Maybe that I realize it's hard to be specific because there's so many jobs and industries, but maybe it's something you did or, I mean, you know, you just, because you, you think we well, can't just pick up the phone and call Sony and say, hey, how's it going? I'm coming over to a perfect example. <laughs> One time a client of mine, she was the VP of marketing for Pac Bell, big telecommunications company. When she contacted me, she figured her only option was to be another marketing executive for another communications company. Very myopic view. 
Uh, she was Jewish, very into her culture, uh, had always wanted to do something in her culture, but you know, she was making big money as a corporate executive. So uh, she came to me, we did a career inventory process where we really got her to realize her value and how cool she was. We branded her with personal branding mm. and we sent her out into what I call the back door where she's just out talking to people, creating relationships, not just specifically in her field. She ended up becoming the executive director of a nonprofit organization mm. that trains bomb sniffing dogs for Israel. Wow. Now, the thing is, she had never gotten that through the front door because she didn't have that kind of background. Sure. See, through the front door, they looked to see, have you done this before? If you haven't, no chance. But through the back door, when people know you and you create relationships, they can go, you know what? You'd be good for this thing. I'm going to connect you with this person. Y'all mm. should talk. And the tr here's what's shocking. 80% of all positions are filled before they're ever. Well, that's process. what I've always heard. In fact, when I go to producers' events, they'll say that, Everybody in the room will say, I mean, big time producers will say they all got the job because of people they knew. And it was never like they're sending out the resume. It was all because of people sure. they knew or that kind of thing. Yeah. So, And in the entertainment industry, everybody knows that because mm -hmm. it's mostly freelance. But but traditional employees, people who work for corporations for three, five, ten years or something, they don't realize the importance of learning how to have that network, how to be a freelancer even though they're working for a Now, network. I know you feel strongly about that. You told us the statistic, but what do you think about that? It's a good or bad that, I mean, the company's already, is it just a fact of life that they can't look at 5,000 resumes that come sent in or... Is it short-sighted or... Not at all. I mean, know. as long as there's people on the planet, it's going to be the case. Because, mm -hmm. for, so take, for instance, a, a, a department within a company. Within that department, if there's going to be an opening, those people right in that department know about it long before the rest of the company knows and definitely long before HR department knows and they run mm -hmm. an ad, right? So those people that are in the know are naturally telling their friends and their relatives and their acquaintances, not just to be nice, but because if there's an empty desk beside you, you don't want a sniveling weirdo there. You'd rather have a friend, someone right. you know. Well, and some companies give recruiting bonuses and things if you help get they somebody do. in. So exactly, that. and that kind of helps short circuit having to pay the fees to the recruiter too, mm -hmm. because they can pay it to their employees. And I guess also the one reason, so you might wonder then why they even post the ad, but I guess what is that, like a legal requirement or something you're supposed to, you have to post the positions there just can, to say you... Well, there can be requirements. And I, uh, I'm not saying that all open positions are, are, are not real. They are, but here's the bad news news is that if you know that for every posted position, there were four others that were filled before it even got posted, wow. you're really cutting yourself out by not getting into the back door, by not, you know, tapping into this hidden job market. And number two, if no, if a lot of people knew about that position and it's still open, why is it still open? So, well, we are running out of time here, um, but just one quick um, tip for how they can sneak in the back door. One concrete thing, something somebody should do to pick up the phone and I don't know, make a call or for, first, join a club or organization or what? If, well, first off, brand yourself, make yourself distinct and unique and get out there and talk to people, create research projects. An ounce of research is worth a pound of job search. Thank you very much. Daryl Gurney, Head Thank Hunters you. Revealed. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Go get that job. Thank <laughs> you.